who obviously met with President Xi just under two weeks ago, uh, had a meeting that you called productive, mm -hmm. the, the handshake moment and everything that came with it. A couple of days later, President Biden referred to President Xi as a dictator. Do you share that view of President Xi? Is he a dictator? You know, one of the reasons that I went to China at the president's behest was to make sure that we had clear, sustained lines of communication to make sure that we can work through our differences to try to prevent the competition that we're in from veering into conflict, uh, and also to see if we can find areas where it makes sense for us to cooperate. But one of the things that I said to our Chinese counterparts is, we are going to say and we are going to do things that you don't like, you do and say a lot of things that we don't like, uh, and we're going to have to work through that. That's what we're doing. And so did that, does that make him a dictator? The president, the president speaks uh, for all of us. He speaks candidly. He speaks clearly. Caddy Kay has a question for you, Mr. Secretary. Caddy? Uh, Mr. Secretary, good morning. I've just come back from a week in Europe, and I was struck by the degree to which uh, people were asking me about two things. One, which is whether Donald Trump would come back again, and that raises concerns about the degree to which allies might start hedging in terms of their policies around China, um, even around Ukraine, uh, wondering where America is going to head in 2024. But also this split between Europe and America, which is pretty evident over the question of China. And I, and I was wondering, you know, what you're hearing from European allies and what you're saying to try and bring them on board with China and what you're saying to them about their concerns about Donald Trump coming back again, possibly. Well, Caddy, first, great to see you, too. Um, and I hate to do this, but I've got to differ with you. Um, I actually think we have more convergence on the approach to China with Europe, as well as with key partners in Asia, than we've seen at any time in recent memory. Um, if you look and listen to what senior leaders in Europe are saying, including Ursula von der Leyen, uh, the, uh, the head of the European Union uh, Commission, uh, we could be exchanging speeches, exchanging talking points, because we're exactly on the same line, both in the challenge that China presents as well as what we're doing about it. Uh, and across the board, um, we are working very closely together to, to deal with that challenge. In fact, one of the things that's evident to me from my conversations in China is that they're concerned with the fact that we have this unity of purpose and unity of action with key European allies as well as in, uh, in Asia. Uh, I don't see that changing. Uh, look, uh, all we can do is to focus on the moment we're in and the responsibilities that we have right now. None of us have a crystal ball when it comes to the future, especially when it comes to, to politics. And at the end of the day, uh, the more successful we are, the more effective we are, both in delivering for our own people and demonstrating that our policies work, the more likely it is they'll be sustained in the future. Mr. Secretary, there is reporting that a big focus of your conversations in Beijing were on Taiwan, with mm. China very concerned about a more aggressive, more nationalistic, more independence-minded president, politician being elected in their coming, upcoming elections. And you were stating your own neutrality about a foreign election. What is your impression uh, about their timeline, President Xi's timeline regarding uh, invading or t trying to take over Taiwan? Uh, CIA Director Burns had said it would be within the next five years. He said that a year ago. Now President Xi has got his third term. Is that more imminent? Andrew, the main concern that we've had uh, with um, Beijing's approach to Taiwan is that it seems bent on changing the status quo that's prevailed for more than 50 years and has actually been a successful part of the relationship that we've had with China, making sure that we could maintain peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait, making sure that any differences uh, were resolved peacefully, that no one on either side engaged in any unilateral effort to change the status quo. And we've had concerns going back to 2016, not just the last months, uh, that China was acting more aggressively when it comes to Taiwan. So we had a, a very direct, very lengthy conversation about this. They have concerns about our policy. I clarified, uh, to the extent it needed to be clarified, that our policy hasn't changed. We abide by, we stick to uh, the longstanding One China policy. And as I said, our expectation is that any differences will be resolved peacefully. But what um, Beijing needs to understand is this is not just a concern for the United States. It's a concern for virtually the entire world. You've got 50 percent of the commercial container traffic, world trade, going through that strait every single day. You've got 70 percent of the semiconductors that the world relies on for our smartphones, for our automobiles, for our dishwashers, made on Taiwan. If there were to be a crisis of China's making over Taiwan and you took all of that offline, you'd have a global economic crisis. And that's why country after country is making it clear to China that their expectation is that China will manage this responsibly. Certainly, that's what we're working to do. 
it's really important that we have these clear, candid, direct, lengthy uh, exchanges on this so that they know exactly where we're coming from and they can also share what, uh, what concerns them.